All right, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Teresa Sheckle, and uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Kenark Child and Family Services. Welcome to this evening's Family Education Session. Our Family Education Series is really intended to build on your ability and your expertise as caregivers to identify, understand, and respond to the mental health needs of your children and youth. This evening, we are pleased to offer education on the topic of medication, how it is used, and what your role is in managing and making decisions about medication for your kids. I have the distinct privilege of introducing this evening's present presenters. Uh, welcome to Francine Zander, who has been a nurse for just about 40 years. 32 of those years have been in children's mental health, and 24 of those years have been at Kinart. And welcome also to Feroz Tashdar, who for the last eight years has been a certified mental health and psychiatric nurse, as well as a clinical therapist. Feroz has been at Kinark since 2019. Both Francine and Feroz have supported our community-based day treatment and live-in treatment programs at Kinark. Before we begin, however, there are a few housekeeping items that I want to go over. Uh, please note that we will be we are recording this session to make it available later on on our website. All participants' phone lines have been muted and cameras uh, have been turned off to ensure that there's a clear connection throughout the session. We've set aside some time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions you might have. Uh, if you have a question, you can select the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and a window will appear to submit your questions. There is an, uh, an anonymous feature if you would like to ask a question anonymously. And please note that we can only respond to general questions relating to today's presentation and individualized advice cannot be provided. We would encourage you to consult with your child's primary physician or specialist as they know your child's unique needs and circumstances better than we do. We will try to respond to as many questions as we can in order to do so and to have adequate time. Similar questions that we receive, we will group and answer them together. And at the end of the evening, we will launch a poll to collect your feedback on the session. If you are having any technical difficulties, use the Q&A feature to let us know. Before I welcome Francine and Froze, however, let's do a poll to find out who you are. You should see the poll come up on the screen very shortly. And we would like to hear if you are a family member, a service provider, or someone else who is interested in this topic area. Are we able to have the poll come up on the screen? Oh, there it is. So if you can. Uh, quickly just respond to our poll so we can get to know who you are. That would be fantastic. And are we able to see the results of the poll just to get a sense so everybody knows who's in the room? Oh, there we go. All right. Super. A lot of parents and a few others who are interested in the topic. That's great. So thank you so much, everyone, for responding to the poll. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters, Francine and Feroz. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um... Welcome to medication education for parents of children with mental illness. Uh, what parents need to know and how uh, they can help. Um, my name is Faroz Tajdar. I'm an RN and mental health nurse. Uh, I've been uh, with Canark since 2019, and I'm very happy to be presenting uh, to you guys some really helpful information. And now I turn it to Francine for introduction. Hi, I'm Francine Zander, and I'm a nurse as well at Kinark and uh, have been working with children's mental health for over 30 years. And uh, 
This is an area of expertise and I enjoy to share the information with you. So welcome. All right, thanks Francine. So uh, the agenda for tonight is uh, men uh, mental health in young people and the use of medication. Uh, we're gonna provide an overview of psychotropic medications, uh, parents' role in medication management, uh, parenting and mental health. So a little bit of uh, statistics uh, where um, uh, you know, psychiatric condition and mental illnesses are in terms of um, its impact on children and youth. Uh, approximately one in five children and youth in Ontario has a mental health challenges. About 70% of mental health challenges have their onset in childhood or youth. That's why early identification and intervention is so critical and can lead to improved achievement in school and better health outcomes in life. Uh, so we're going to be uh, talking about some of uh, the um, you know, common uh, mental health challenges or psychiatric disorders. Uh, for example, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder uh, or ADHD, anxiety disorders, uh, mood disorders, autism spectrum disorder. Um, not so much eating disorder because that uh, topic in itself requires another presentation. So maybe in future, uh, we'll, we'll provide some sort of presentation on that topic because that topic deserves a separate presentation. Um, these mental health challenges, uh, we're going to be, you know, defining what they are, how it's impacting the youth uh, and then children, and also some of the most common medication and um, other behavior uh, interventions are available uh, to treat these conditions successfully. So what is ADHD? Uh, ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Uh, ADHD is a developmental impairment of the brain's executive functions. Uh, people with ADHD have a hard time to sit still, pay attention, or make good decisions. ADHD often uh, begins in childhood, uh, and uh, it can cause a child to have trouble in school, at home, uh, or with friends. ADHD is more common in males than in females. What ADHD is not? ADHD is not a behavior disorder. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, sometimes you know, we may hear that maybe that this child is um, causing uh, challenges um, intentionally or maybe manipulative um, or just a bad kid. It's actually they're uh, struggling with ADHD, and which requires a treatment, and there are successful treatment available both, both through medication and therapy, which uh, Francine is going to talk about that. And ADHD is not a specific learning disorder or disability. There is no cure for ADHD, but different treatments can help improve a child's symptoms and behavior. Uh, and uh, both adults and children can be diagnosed with ADHD. There are a lot of research and um, evidence-based um, guidelines available on successfully treating ADHD, both through medications uh, and uh, some uh, through behavior interventions. So even though there is no cure, sex, uh, recovery is very possible. Anxiety in young people. Anxiety is part of uh, the human condition. Worries and fears are a natural and adaptive part of childhood uh, development and important for good coping and survival. Anxiety becomes a concern when it causes excessive distress, uh, gets in the way of daily functioning, goals and or development. Anxiety disorders are the most common uh, childhood onset psychiatric disorders. Anxiety disorders in children up to 12 years uh, or, or old and adolescent 13 to 18 years old are associated with educational underachievement and co-occurring psychiatric condition as well as functional impairment that can extend into childhood. Anxiety, uh, in, in our practice, we see uh, more commonly co-occur with other conditions, um, whether it's um, ADHD, autism, someone has a depression, you can also see some features of anxiety. So it's very common to see that. And um, as I said, it, it, uh, there is also successful treatment, uh, both through medication and behavior intervention for anxiety as well. Depression. Uh, so depression is a mood disorder that makes a person sad, irritable, or hopeless uh, for a long period of time. Depression can make it hard for a child to enjoy activities, perform well in school, and relate to their family, friends, and teachers. People uh, often think of depression as an adult problem and not something that affects children, but children, especially teens, 
can suffer from depression too. So autism spectrum disorder, what is uh, ASD? Uh, so ASD is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by deficits in social communication and social interaction and the restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, uh, interest, and activities. People with ASD may also have different ways of learning, moving, or uh, paying attention. Researchers have consistently found more boys than girls with autism when estimating conditions prevalence. It's reported through several studies that the co-occurrence of ASD and ADHD is in the range of 30 to 50%. And um, if you have, if, um, you're wondering why the, such such uh, uh, you know high prevalence or co-occurrence. Uh, we we're not able to find the actual cause, but one thing we're seeing that ADHD and uh, autism they both co-occur at a high level. So let's talk a little bit about treating mental health illnesses. So um, there are several types of treatments available uh, for mental health challenges. We have psychotherapy and counseling. Obviously, we're talking about medication, so prescription medications, and other complementary therapies and treatments. And often, more often than not, a combination of, the, of a few of these um, is more effective than one alone to treat a major illness. But it's really important to understand that it's always recommended that you start with a visit to your primary health care practitioner to seek support, assessment, and recommendations. And your health care practitioner may be your family doctor, it may be a nurse practitioner, it could be a pediatrician. And if they can't help, they can refer you to someone who can. So now we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit more in depth about the medications that are used in mental health. And we call them psychotropic medications. So these are medications, um, and there are five different groups of these medications. We have anti-anxiety medications. We have antidepressant medications, antipsychotic medications, mood stabilizers, and stimulants. So what do you need to know about medications? So there are risks and benefits, and they should be discussed both with parents as well as the youth or the child when initiating treatment. It's really important that everyone understands the plan around the medication and the rationale for using the medication. And we have to remember that medication does not cure the mental illness, but it can effectively manage symptoms of mental health illness. So administration should always be started at, at its lowest available dose in children. But it also should be considered that it should be started at its lowest dose with anyone, not just children. So children, youth, and adults. The dose can be increased incrementally if tolerated well after one week. And so often you have to adjust the dose in order to get the benefit of the medication. So adverse effects. We have to uh, weigh out the risks um, against the benefits. Sometimes in a psychiatric um, focus, you may have things like disinhibition, disinhibition uh, agitation, worsening of symptoms, or in a physical way, some of the side effects may be headaches, upset stomach, sleep problems. So let's talk a little bit more about specific medications. And let's start with ADHD. So Feroz um, explained to you what ADHD was and what it wasn't. Now let's talk a bit about the medications that are used to help treat ADHD. And again, treat, not cure. So we have two different groups of medications. We have stimulant medications, which are considered the first line of treatment for ADHD. And they're in groups, uh, family groups of amphetamines or methylphenidate. Um, then we have non-stimulant groups. And the non-stimulant group is um, prescribed to patients who don't tolerate or see benefits from the stimulant group of medications. Three non-stimulants have been approved for the treatment of ADHD, and they are atomoxetine, guanfacine, and clonidine. 
Non-stimulants may also be prescribed for use alongside with stimulants to better manage ADHD symptoms. Now this slide is going to show you a little bit about what possible side effects may be connected with medications for ADHD. So I call this little fellow in the middle, Bob, for ease of discussion. And Bob will show you on his body and the colors um, where some of those side effect profiles may present themselves. So you'll see the blue in his head, it shows that possible dizziness, drowsiness, fatigue, trouble with sleeping, behavioral problems may occur. Also, we see sweating. We see upset stomach, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, and weight loss. And we also see, also see muscle ticks. Now, I just wanna highlight that with the stimulant medication, we often see more, more commonly the loss of appetite and possible weight loss. And that raises a lot of anxiety for parents because we're usually these meds are being uh, prescribed to very young children, um, as young as six years old. And so we don't want to see these, these young children um, have issues with weight gain and growth. So it's really important to understand that these medications, the stimulant medications work, they're in and out the same day. So that means that but the side effect symptoms are only present during the active phase of the medication. So if your child is on medication such as these and they do have the side effect profile of loss of appetite, remember that that's not them being willful. It's that they're physically, their appetite has been suppressed. And so they'll need to wait till the medication is out of their system for their appetite to come back. So generally, you know, if you're, if you sit at the, dinner table at five o'clock, your child may not be hungry at five. But if your rule is to sit at the dinner table at five, the child should sit at, at the dinner table with you and you can just wrap the food and give it to them later when the medication is out of their system. So those are things, easy ways to manage this so that you don't have power struggle. Medication for depression and anxiety. So these medications, um, there are a couple of different ones. There's the first line of medications, which are considered um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We call them SSRIs. Then we have the second and third, which are the SNRIs, uh, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And then we have the tricyclic antidepressants. And generally speaking, um, the SSRIs are the first choice, but um, physicians sometimes will choose from the second and third options. Generally, the first group, group the SSRIs, have a fewer known side effects. And so that's why they go um, and choose those ones first. But at times, they're not the right combination. And um, physicians will choose the FNRI or the tricyclic antidepressants. But they all work on the same things, both depression and anxiety. Now this slide is gonna show you a little bit of information more about the antidepressant group, like the uh, FSRIs or SNRIs or the tricyclics. And the reason we wanna to talk to you about this is because the, this group of medications, um, you know, they're not like the stimulant medications that are in and out the same day. These medications need to be taken the same time every single day and be consistently taken in order for the medications to develop a level in the bloodstream that is therapeutic. But initially, the individual may have um, side effects that pop up right away. So they might feel a little nauseated, a little bit dizzy, a little headaches, that sort of thing. And it takes about you know two to three weeks, sometimes a month, to get the benefit of a particular dose of antidepressant um, medication or anti-anxiety medication. And so for the individual, it's really important to understand that they're gonna to have to wait for the benefits, but the side effects might be present right away. And it's important to understand that because we don't want them to get discouraged thinking the medication's not gonna work for them. The other thing that's really important to consider is that um, the FDA or the Federal Drug Association 
has what we call a black box warning, and it's the highest level of warning for any medication. And antidepressants carry this black box warning, and it's related to the increased risk of suicide while taking these medications. Generally, the risk is related to the increased energy that a youth may develop once starting the medication. Because we know that people that are depressed have low levels of energy, but they may have suicidal thoughts. And if they have those thoughts, but don't have the energy to follow through, the risk is when they start on an antidepressant, before they reach the benefit of that medication, they may experience the energy required to follow through on those thoughts. So the first month is a really important time to have a really good safety plan in place when they start on these medications. So it's not that they shouldn't start these medications because these medications could be very beneficial. It's just to make sure that you work with your therapist, with your doctor, to make sure there's a safety plan in place. Some of the potential side effects um, besides the, the increased suicidal thought um, is sweating, upset stomach, diarrhea, constipation, possible headaches, dizziness, dry mouth, blurred vision, trouble sleeping, and feeling tired, and also difficulty urinating and sexual problems, so libido problems. Um, the thing about this is it's really important to understand, as you've seen already with the, the other medications that I talked about, some of these side effect profiles are what I call nuisance side effects. They're there at the beginning. So the queasiness, the upset stomach, the headaches, they tend to dissipate and go away as your body gets used to the medication. So the, those side effect profiles may not stay. They may just be at the beginning or the onset of taking the medication. So that's really important to understand. And that's why you revisit your doctor because you you discuss the risks and benefits all along the way, okay? So um, we talk about evidence and I know that Perot's talked about um, different treatments and it's really important to understand the effectiveness of treatment. And here this slide is talking about how research has shown that children aged seven to 17 with anxiety, very much or much anxiety, show clinical improvement after 12 weeks of treatment. So 55% will have that with just medication, 60% with just therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy here, and 81% find benefit with a combination of medication and therapy. So it's really important to understand that these are all tools and they work well together, okay? Go ahead, Farouk. All right. Back. Thanks, Francine. Uh, so, um, medication for uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, again, these medications uh, is not going to treat autism. The potential benefits and risk of medication therapy for children with ASD must, must be um, assessed on a case by case basis. Uh, and only two medications are approved by the FDA specifically for irritability associated with autism, uh, and it's risperidone and aripiprazole. Um, Aripiprazole is also called Abilify, commonly. Uh, and these two medications belong to second-generation antipsychotic. Uh, just because it, these two medications belongs to antipsychotic, that doesn't mean your son or daughter uh, you know, has a psychotic disorder. Um, it's, um, and, and these second-generation antipsychotics are uh, used for a wide variety of psychiatric conditions. Uh, and uh, so medication should be used to target specific symptoms that are clearly defined, and the symptoms should be measured over time to monitor treatment benefits. Uh, it's also important to periodically reevaluate the need for continued treatment. Uh, children with ASD are more sensitive to medications and more likely to have side effects than children with, without ASD. So for caregivers and parents, uh, it's really important to keep an eye on uh, which symptoms are improving with these medication. And uh, if you are also, if you are noticing uh, some symptoms are coming back or new symptoms that you are seeing uh, to uh, uh, like to report that to your uh, prescriber and also have a closer relationship with your um, prescriber and making sure that there is a follow-up appointment also booked uh, to assess the effectiveness of these medications. 
So um, some of the uh, side effect profile of antipsychotic medications, um, it's, it's a very long list of side effects. Some uh, side effects are more common than the others. Uh, so for example, in the blue, when you see dizziness and drowsiness, that's where, you know, at the beginning, you will see um, as the body is adjusting to, uh, you know, if, if the dizziness is mild to moderate and if if, if the kid is, is uh, functioning okay and they're not, you know, passing out or they're not drowsy to the point of napping periodically throughout the day, that's an extreme side effect and that should be reported to your prescriber right away. Uh, but the minor, like a little bit of a dizziness, drowsiness, that's all expected. And, and as the body adjusts to it, that, that should go away. Now, more uh, long-term side effects, um, which we have observed in our uh, practice is um, uh, breast discharge. Uh, for men, we call it gynecomastia, enlargement of uh, breast men. And then there is a, a discharge com coming. And uh, for some kids, it's, uh, they feel very embarrassed. And sometimes they don't share these uh, side effects with anyone because it's so so embarrassing for them. So as a caregiver, it's important to keep an eye on that. And if you're seeing any unusual side effect, uh, to um, you know, report that to your um, prescriber. And uh, when when such side effect happens, there are some hormonal changes happening. And uh, those are like very temporary as the medication is adjusted or switched to another medication, uh, those side effects will go away. The other side effect is constipation. Uh, we have seen as well, weight gain is another one, uh, depending on which antipsychotic is uh, prescribed. So in the previous slide, I mentioned Risperidone uh, and Abilify. Risperidone is um, the most effective, but it comes with a lot of side effects, especially with weight gain, because um, it increases a person's appetite and, um, and someone ending, ending up eating more, which leads to weight gain. Other side effects, uh, some long-term, uh, for example, uh, stiffness and the shaking. Not everyone will experience these side effects. Uh, and uh, rarely uh, some side effects will be very serious. But it's important to uh, keep an eye on which, um, you know, what kind of uh, improvement are, are you seeing in your, in your son or daughter and what kind of uh, new symptoms are coming up so that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a negative experience for the child because they're they're suffering from the the side effects they may not talk about it it may be embarrassing so it's it's uh, it's good to be uh, like keeping an eye on on those side effects it's usually at the beginning uh, we want to make sure that these side effects are taken care of and uh, what do i need to know about medications and mental illnesses uh, when discussing the use of psychiatric medications with your doctor open communication can help to find the right psychiatric medications for your child and, and youth. Medication will not produce the same effect in all children and youth. Changes in dose doses or a psychiatric medication are not unusual. You probably see or experience that sometimes medications are switched very rapidly uh, or very quickly. And it's um, uh, it's really to uh, not, not leave it for a long time to see for improvement because uh, again, uh, these medications are prescribed for for children and uh, if we're not seeing, for example, improvement, depending on what the condition they're treating for anxiety and depression, four to eight weeks of time, that's where we would like to see how things are. And if uh, there is no improvement and then then uh, that close uh, communication with the prescriber is really important to see if there is not uh, noticeable improvement, then another uh, medication from the same class is tried. So it's not unusual to, to see a psych psychiatrists and uh, um, other specialists try different medications. It's just to try and find the right combination or the right medication for that uh, condition that they are trying to treat. All medications, including herbal supplements and over-the-counter medications, as well as other forms of treatment should be discussed with your doctor. If these treatments are used in combination with psychiatric medications, there may be drug interactions or side effects that may be dangerous for your child. So it's really important um, that uh, and if you're seeing a naturopath, for example, uh, to, to see their recommendation for medication and then uh, your son and daughter is prescribed a psychotropic medication, it's really important that both prescribers are aware uh, that uh, which medication that um, the youth is on so that um, uh, they're not causing uh, this youth an uh, inadvertent uh, harm uh, by you know prescribing uh, these medications. So it's really important to um, keep both of them informed of uh, 
uh, uh, herbal supplements. So uh, what can you ask the prescriber? Uh, ask your doctor for clarification on anything you don't understand. Communication supports shared decision-making and improves uh, treatment outcomes. Um, at the beginning, uh, when your son or daughter is, is diagnosed, it's really uh, uh, you know, a tough time for, for everyone to, to understand and to kind of process. And, and there's maybe a lot of question in your mind uh, it's always helpful to you know have a pen and paper with you um, so that you know anything the doctor uh, talks about or recommends you can write it down and then when you go home you can uh, review those um, those some of these strategies can be very helpful. So question you can ask your doctor: What is the name of the medication? Uh, what are uh, the symptoms this medication is supposed to treat? What if my child cannot swallow pills? Are there any other options? So. Not all me all medication, the majority of medication will come in other forms. So from patches to liquid uh, and things like that. So making sure that if uh, that is also being uh, discussed, uh, how and when should I, should my child take it? Uh, what should I do if my child misses a dose? What are some of the most common side effects of this medication? What should I do if side effects happen? How long will it take for the medication to start working? Uh, is there any reason to stop uh, taking the medication, when should we see you again? Uh, this is very important. Uh, when these medications are prescribed, there is always a need to have a at least every four to six weeks follow-up right away to making sure that there is clear um, monitoring of these medications. Uh, so at the beginning, there is more frequency of follow-up, but once the medication is um, you know, uh, improving some of the symptoms, then the appointments are less frequent. Is there uh, information handout for me to take home? Some psychiatrists or physicians, uh, they have access to really reliable handouts uh, or a medication guide or um, a guide for that particular uh, condition that they are treating. Uh, feel free to ask for that. They have access to these. And, um, and if they don't, then the, the pharmacist will have uh, access to that information. Uh, at the end, we're also going to share some really uh, helpful uh, websites that are um, evidence-based uh, that you can also access to look up uh, medication or uh, our condition uh, there. So what can you ask the pharmacist? Um, it's good to work with uh, one pharmacy and pharmacist who knows your child and the medications they take, uh, how they react to the medication and if they could be at risk of any drug interactions. It's always a great idea to uh, staying with one pharmacist uh, they can also help with uh, keeping a history of the medication and different medications that's been tried. So if at some point, you know, you've been referred to a specialist uh, or, or, or another doctor, then you can, you know, uh, quickly access a medication list from the pharmacy. And that can be very uh, handy uh, for that specialist to review. So how uh, should the medication be taken with or without food and when a uh, number of times or best time of day should I take the medication? Um, how long will it take the medication to work? Uh, what are uh, common side effects of this medication? When do they happen? Tell me about any serious side effects that can happen, and what do they? Uh, what to do if they uh, happen? If there are any reason my child should stop taking the medication, should my child avoid any food or drink? Does my drug plan cover this medication? How much does it cost? So it's really important depending on the, maybe if it's a um, teen, uh, making sure that they're not mixing their medication with other substances, for example, alcohol, uh, as it may um, have a serious uh, interaction and may lead to um, a harm. So making sure that that's, that's not happening. And the parents and children um, and youth need to have conversation about mental illness and treatment options. It's really important we we strongly advocate for um, no matter how young the child is to include them in psychiatric assessment and, and follow-ups because this is uh, really to empower the kid from get-go and to involve them in their own treatment because at the end of the day, we're, we're treating their uh, mental health struggles, so they need to have control over that. And it also takes away from, from parents and caregivers uh, as well so you're not taking the role of a pharmacist or a prescriber explaining the medication, how you need to take it, how often, 
uh, we want you to be a parent and uh, uh, do that job. So uh, let let the specialist, the pharmacists, and the uh, the prescribers uh, do the job and explain the, um, the the reason why they're prescribing this medication and why they need to take it and uh, things like that. It makes it so much easier, and the relationship will be much smoother uh, to involve uh, the kid from a very from from the get go in in their treatment planning, especially medication, because you know there will be times that they don't want to take it. Sometimes they may have question, oh, why am I taking this medication? I'm not. I'm feeling well. So th so they're involved with in in that in that process. And any question that comes, uh, and if they're in that appointment, they can ask that question directly from the prescriber. So important things to remember. Um, Medications of any kind prescribed over the counter or herbal supplements should never be mixed without consulting the doctor. Medication uh, should never be borrowed from another person, other health professionals who may prescribe a drug such as a dentist or other medical specialists should be told that the person is taking a specific medication in dosage. Uh, some drugs, although safe when taken alone, can cause severe and danger dangerous side effects if taken with other drugs or uh, alcohol. All right, so what can help? As you can uh, see uh, the, the picture, uh, adequate sleep. Um, again, uh, I'm looking forward to maybe in the future to talk about sleep. That in itself uh, deserves um, a whole presentation because uh, um, uh, sleep for uh, children in, uh, in teen is an epidemic uh, situation. And um, and then I've, I've, I've seen a lot of teen and children not, not sleeping enough. So that that is not helping and it makes them more vulnerable to experience intense emotions, make their mental health struggles struggles worse. So adequate sleep is really important. Some of the basic stuff, making sure the room is dark, they're not going to bed hungry, uh, the TV is not in their room, um, and, and some of the basic stuff and making sure that they go to bed uh, the same time, even on holidays or weekend. So there's that consistency. Exercise is, is a great way of that in releasing that energy. Uh, it's great for phys uh, physical um, health as well as mental health. And, and also uh, uh, nutritious um, food, uh, making sure kids are eating veggies and the fruits and um, healthy, um, uh, you know, other uh, healthy food and uh, making sure that they're not skipping their breakfast or lunch or dinner or, or snack so that, you know, they keep fueling their body throughout the day. Uh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so here we are, parenting and mental health. Let's talk about how, you know, parent being a parent at the best of times is hard work. But parenting a child with mental health issues is so much harder. You're almost certainly putting in more effort than any other mother or father that you know. Yet your child may still be at risk, struggling or making less progress than his or her peers. This raises a crucial, crucial question. How can you keep going without becoming exhausted? So avoiding parent burnout requires real effort. Experts note it includes consistent self-care, establishing a strong support network for yourself, and having trustworthy therapeutic team for your child. So it's really important to understand that you don't have to do this alone. You can seek out support from your physician, from your healthcare practitioners, from your pharmacist, from your therapist, and the whole teams available to you to support your child when they're receiving therapy. So these are really important things. And including your personal support team. So any family members that you can count on to give you a break from time to time. Then we'll talk a little bit about self-care. Self-care means taking care of yourself. That's exactly what it says. So that you can be healthy, you can be well, and you can do your job. And you can take care of others. And you can do all the things you need to do and want to accomplish in, an, in everyday settings. 
Parents want to be the best they can be for their children, especially if their children are struggling with mental health issues. But it's really important for parents to address their own personal needs in order to do so. So self-care, there are many areas involved in self-care. And here there are six listed. So when you think about self-care, you think of physically taking care of yourself, feeding yourself, rest, sleep, personal hygiene, hygiene needs. When we talk about psychological, it involves learning, thinking, and growing things. All the things that you allow yourself to grow as an individual. When we talk about emotional, it's about becoming aware and identifying what you're feeling and allowing yourself to have those emotions. Your children have emotions. We all have emotions. And it's about recognizing those emotions and recognizing when you are feeling more emotional and perhaps not able to deal with certain things at certain times. And that's okay. And that's when you call on those support people. We talk about spiritual. And that's recognition of a feeling or sense or belief that there's something greater than self that we are part of, either cosmic or divine in nature. So whether that's whatever your beliefs are, whether it's spirit, whether it's religious, whether it's you believe in the universe and the cosmic um, karma, whatever that is. Personal, spending time on yourself, doing the things that make you happy, that fuel you to regenerate your energy. And then professional. It's really important to have a really healthy work-life balance. And when you have children with mental health, your life balance part sometimes is very, very heavy. And so the work, it's important to understand that you may need um, extra understanding at work to be able to support you in that area. The way that you can deal with things and help yourself is through mindfulness. And a lot of times when your child is, you know, working through therapy, they'll be taught how to do mindfulness. And so it's not a bad idea to help your child work through the mindfulness exercises by doing them with them. So you can do any type of meditation in which you focus on being intensely aware of what you're sensing, feeling in the moment without interpretation or judgment. Just recognize how you feel. There are many YouTube videos that you can access that'll guide you through a meditation. And it's really important. There are many of them out there as well for children. So if you can try and help your child to relax and calm themselves and be mindful of how they're feeling, it will help you in the long run as well. So practicing mindfulness involves breathing methods, guided imagery, and other practices to relax the body and mind. And all of that helps to reduce stress. Mindfulness-based treatments have also been shown to reduce anxiety and depression because it allows the person to recognize when we talk about being in emotional mind. So you know when you're in emotional mind, you're not really able to think logically often because you're too emotional. And so it's really important to recognize the emotions that an individual is going through. And so that will help you to be able to um, keep yourself in a really good checks and balances, to know when you can deal with issues and when you're just a little too emotional. So it's important for you to find some way to be mindful and to be calm and to reduce your level of stress as well. So that's basically all we had to say about uh, medication and stuff. But these are some of the resources um, that are out there that are, um, you know, evidence-based. And you can find information about, you can see the first one, chat.org, is basically an ADHD support um, website. 
Attitude is also an ADHD website. Medlineplus.gov is um, information about medications. Childmind.org will also give you information about diagnoses and treatments. Um, and then the Kids Help Phone Line um, or .ca is a website where you can go and just get information, get support, there's chats. So these are some really good resources for you to be able to use.